Sarah, before you leave the stage, I'm going to put you on the spot. And uh, I don't know, God's stirring something in your heart these days? Yeah. Whew. I've been like trying to hold back emotion this morning because it's a very personal thing. When we stepped in here on Thursday night, I knew what I was supposed to share, but I didn't want to because it's very hard for me to get through without being emotional. Um, it's a, it was a vision. Let me go back to, I mean, you all, the last three years, the political climate, the pandemic, all the stuff that we've been through, that was quite a ride. And, and we're still kind of in the middle of that ride. But if you were like me, I don't know, you may have seen believers, Christian people arguing online over everything. And I'm talking about from the start of the, you know, before the, the big election and, um, and just the things that I was seeing people bicker about, it just really grieved me. And then with the pandemic and then with all these different issues that were happening and it's like it was just mounting one on top of another and I just found myself in a state of grief and, and I would just pray and cry. And then with the death of George Floyd and then there was all this stuff and, um, and I found myself on my knees. And um, I just said, Father, I just want all the noise to stop. I just want all the voices and all this fighting and everything to stop. And I just want to hear what you have to say, what you alone have to say, because that's all that matters. And um, so I found myself that night. I got in my bed. I, I laid down. I read some scripture. And as soon as I closed my eyes, I felt like I was taken away somewhere with the Holy Spirit. And I've had visions, I've had dreams and different things like that. But in this moment, I felt like I physically was taken to this place. And it was so tangible and so real. And I was kneeling down in prairie grass in a field and I looked out. It was at night. There was a big lake in front of me and a full moon shining down, like reflecting in the lake, you know, that was magnifying the moon. And I felt, now I know the Holy Spirit is in me, but I felt his tangible presence sitting next to me. And, sorry. Um, so I, I turned to look at him and I was really surprised at what I saw um, because I saw a Native American chief sitting next to me in the grass, <laughs> but I knew it was the Holy Spirit in that form. And, and I felt what he was, I felt his longing the longing of his heart. And he was looking out at the moon and the reflection and he would look at me and he was in a state of waiting. And it was as if he was saying, I've given the answer. I had given the answer long ago, but this goes all the way back to the roots of this nation and I'm waiting on my people. And so while God's people are you know, in a state of arguing with each other and casting judgment and blame and pointing fingers. It's like he's just sitting there going, I've given you everything and I've given you the answer. And so when I arrived here, well, let me go back. Also in that field, there was a tree in the distance with fabric ties tied to the branches blowing in the wind. And those are, they're known as prayer ties. So a lot of native people, when they would pray, they would tie these prayers into the tree. And so I, I felt like he was saying, you know, there's all these prayers for generations that have gone out and, and they're hanging there and there he is, the answer. He's given us everything and he's just waiting on us. Whew. Um, it's, so it's just brought me to a place of realizing just I know that there are people individually who have gone out and there have been acts of uh, repentance, you know, things that started at the beginning of our nation, you know, with slaughtering people and stuff like that. And I know that there's been repentance, but there's something we're missing. I feel like it's on a corporate level and I'm asking the Holy Spirit, how do we do this on a corporate level? Where does the healing come? So on Thursday, when I walked in and I knew that I was supposed to share that, I feel like there's something about the land here and, and where you guys are planted and what you're going to do and what you're bringing here 
but there's a voice that's crying out. Because I didn't feel like sharing this, I, um, I asked the Lord for a couple of signs. And so I think it was that very night I walked out there and there was a man wearing, um, he had, it was a Native American chief on his hat, but it actually had a dog on it. And I thought, well, of course, a dog spelled backwards is God. So I thought that was kind of funny, but it had the, the headdress and everything. And then last night we were talking with Charlie Coker and we began talking about the land and how he's prayed over, you know, just this region for years. And he said, he said, when I came and prayed a few years ago, he said, I heard the blood of the innocent crying out. And he said, for three days, I heard that. And I knew, I was like, I know that I'm supposed to release this. I don't even fully understand. I don't fully grasp I just know this experience. I know that he's waiting. And so I guess what I'm trying to say is just we as the body, we want to see transformation. We want to see revival. We want to see all these amazing things happen. And we want to see our cities changed. But it, we block that when we engage in that argumentative, judgmental, finger-pointing thing. You know, and in the book of James... He says, these things ought not to be. We have to let the fresh waters of life flow through us if we're going to see this change. And it starts on a very practical level. So just ask the Holy Spirit, what is your role in that? And how can you be a part of seeing this transformation and see revival come? And what do we do about that, the blood that was spilled, you know, the blood of the innocents? And we've got to acknowledge it. And instead of arguing over things, when these issues come up, acknowledge and pray and release love. And I'm excited for you guys. And I had no idea, Scott and Lisa, I knew you were building a building, but I had no idea, like, the enormity of this project. And so I, I walked in, and I was like, wow, this is amazing. And you've built room for some amazing things to happen in this community and I know it's going to so I'm just I just want to speak blessing over you guys for stepping out and doing such a big thing and I know it's not easy and this is not an easy thing to carry and so they need you like everybody in this area you have a part you have a role and whether it's directly connected here you have something to do in your region. And so I just bless you in Jesus' name to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit and to know what that is. And just in your daily life, just to walk in love, walk in compassion, ask the Holy Spirit every morning for guidance and he'll show you. And anyway, I've talked way too long, but I felt that I was supposed to release that. And um, anyway, I love you guys. I never know what she's going to release when she says, I feel led to release something because she doesn't waste words. We were in a church one time and she says, um, she goes, I, I've, I feel like I've got a word to release. And, and I said, okay. And she got up and said, I feel like the Lord says, um, this church is spiritually constipated, but there's release coming. Okay. And I'm like, oh no, right? Every toilet in the church backed up and exploded and flooded the church. So now, whenever she says, I've got a word to release, I'm like, please be kind to the building. This place is brand new. So, anyway. <laughs> yeah. I was praying recently about asking the Lord how to move forward in this next season. And... There's different kinds of words that you get when you go into a place. Sometimes I'll get words for individual people and share those. Some That's happened some this week. There's words that happen corporately as a body. Then there's words that happen globally. And the global words are, are to me, they, they, they carry just a tremendous amount of weight. This word that I'm about to share with you today is a word that came to me personally that I felt like was personal for my heart. Started opening up in conversations with people a couple of months ago. And then uh, I, I went to a church. One of the first places I felt like I was supposed to drop this word, the, the response uh, confirmed to me that this is something for the body of Christ, not just for me individually, not just for a handful of people, 
uh, not for one body corporately, but for, for the body of Christ globally. And so what I'm going to share with you today is something that, that is for Journey Center. It's for this region, but I believe it's for, for everyone. And so if you get your Bibles, go, go to Daniel chapter 9. The Lord drew me to a deep dive into the book of Daniel. And most of the time when I go to Daniel, I go for the purpose of looking looking for end times clues, you know, things like that. That's that's typically what Daniel has been. It's been a book about about uh, prophetic. Uh, Daniel has five prophetic encounters, and a lot of them have to do with, especially the last two, have to do with things that were going to happen in Daniel's future. And so it's really easy to look at those encounters and then apply them to our day and try to figure out from what Daniel saw where we are in the prophetic calendar. So when I felt like the Lord said, I want you to go to Daniel, so much was being asked to me about end time stuff that I felt like that he was going to give me a revelation about that. I ended up not getting anything about the end times. There is some stuff, and it's in that series back there, uh, but, but that's not what I'm talking about today. I felt like the Lord was drawing my attention to the character of Daniel because there was something that God had placed within Daniel that is actually inherent within the DNA buried deep, but inherent within the DNA of every child of God. But it's up to you and I to partner with the Holy Spirit to see it come to the surface. And it matters more than you think, whether it does or not. I started looking and I saw five characteristics of the life of Daniel that I felt like God was saying to me personally, Bill, I want these to be stirred up in your own life. You guys remember how when Paul came to Timothy and he says to him, stir up the gift that's in you. Stop and think about that. It wasn't, it wasn't a natural talent that he was talking about. It was a spiritual impartation, a deposit of heaven that was inside of Timothy because he's a child of God. And Paul looks at Timothy and says, Stir that up. In other words, you take responsibility to dig down deep and pull to the surface what the Holy Spirit has put within you. All right? Sometimes things get stirred up within us when we get shaken out of our complacency. Like we don't know how strong we are unless we face resistance. See what I'm saying? Uh, in in uh, Arizona, the biosphere I can't remember if I said this on Thursday or night, but it's a Thursday or not, but it's an illustration that's been stirring in my spirit a lot lately. The biosphere in Arizona, they planted trees and the trees grew and they were beautiful, but when they got to a certain point, before they reached full maturity, they started falling over. Scientist goes over to one of the trees left standing and reaches up to grab one of the limbs and it just snapped off like it's nothing. There was very little holding these trees together, even though they looked good from the outside but they had constructed a perfect environment in this biosphere, but they left one thing out, wind. No wind. These trees had never felt wind. I had a, uh, a neighbor, uh, Mr. Hirschberger, God bless him. Um, he'd go out and get his neighbor in, in Minnesota. He'd go out and get his paper every morning, get his paper out, and he had these little saplings that he had planted in his yard. We lived down in a valley, and he'd go around and smack these trees and I go, what are you doing? And he goes, I'm not growing any wimpy trees. There's no wind down in this valley. You got to kind of smack these trees around. It says, it makes the roots go deep. That's not child, that's not like child rearing advice, okay? I'm just saying, that's, don't take that as a, <laughs> don't take that as parenting advice here, okay? But I, what I'm saying is this, that even science will tell you that without wind resistance, trees don't form the kind of strength necessary to actually grow to full maturity. Some of you come to, to church to get out of the wind. Give your life to Jesus and all my problems are going to go away. No. John 16, Jesus says this, These things I've spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. It's a strange thing, but it's a time tense issue. In this world, you will have future tense trouble. But be of good cheer. I have. What tense is that? Past. I have, past tense, overcome the world. What is he saying? I've already been in your future. I've seen everything that you will ever face, every challenge you will ever face, and I've already imparted and deposited in you everything necessary to walk through every challenge and emerge victorious on the other side. 
What we want him to do is to take away all of the challenges. We want him to shut down the wind and the waves. But Jesus has a thing about wind and waves. He does two things in the wind and the waves. One is he takes a nap. And when he's not napping, he's surfing. You say, I thought he just walked on the water. Forget the paintings that show Jesus looking like, you know, he's like super serene, wind and waves, but where he's walking. Jesus is in his early 30s, you guys. I know a lot of guys in their early 30s in California. You know what they like to do? Surf. wonder where they got that idea. They're made in the image and likeness of God. When Jesus went to spend time alone with the Father, we think he went up into the hills to do some serious praying and fasting. No, I think he went to go crank up the wave machine, and he's out there surfing without a board. When the disciples are on the sea and it's winds and waves, what do they do? They look out and they see Jesus coming right at them, and they freak out. What is he doing? He is literally enjoy he is the master of the wind and the waves, and he cranks it up when he gets on the water. And if he lives in you, then no matter what the wind and the waves are doing, listen, you can find joy in the middle of all of it. And that's what you need when the wind and the waves come. How many know that? Why? Because the joy of the Lord is your what? Your strength. Circumstances in life and wind and waves cause us to feel weak. We need strength. Daniel had this thing with God where in five areas he developed the kind of strength and root system that actually positioned him to shape the course of history for hundreds of years, for multi-generational discipleship. That's what I'm praying for, that God awakens within us the passion for multi-generational discipleship. Okay? Daniel is set up by a prophet named Jeremiah. Jeremiah is between 30 and 50 years older than Daniel, and he's kind of a lonely character. He's prophesying Babylon's going to come in here, and Babylon's actually going to take us captive, you guys. Nobody believes and listens to Jeremiah, but there are a few people that take him seriously enough to say, let's not take any chances. We're getting out of here, and we're going to Egypt. Jeremiah, come along. And so he does. Jeremiah never goes into captivity. He's sharp enough to miss that whole thing. You wonder, listen, you wonder whatever happens to these guys. Jeremiah, we have no idea what happens to him 100%, but here's what legends say. Legends say when he gets to, to Egypt, Jeremiah prophesies over some people that didn't like what he said, and they stone him to death. Jeremiah's followers take his body and they bury it. And one of the things that Jeremiah did when he got to Egypt is he prayed away all of the vipers and all the crocodiles out of the Nile. So for the time that he lived there, nobody got attacked and killed by vipers or crocodiles. The people around honored and acknowledged that he had that much power spiritually. So if they got bit by a viper after he died, they go to Jeremiah's grave, take some dust off his grave, put it on the viper bite, and they would live. This is just local legend. Alexander the Great comes along, and he hears about this, and he takes it so seriously, he digs up Jeremiah's body and takes it to Alexandria. We have no idea where it is today. Nonetheless, there was anointing wrapped up in this guy. Okay, He sets up Daniel. By the time Daniel is a young man, here comes Babylon coming in to take Israel captive and destroy the city of Jerusalem, including the temple that had stood for 800 years. They take all the stuff out of the temple, and Nebuchadnezzar, who's crazy as a bag of cats, takes it all back to Babylon and puts it in his own house to party with the stuff. This guy is evil to the core. He doesn't just want to destroy Jerusalem. He wants to take all of the Jews and make them Babylonians and expand his empire. So he's going to do something that is brutal. He's going to try to rip away their identity. He takes Nebuchadne Nebuchadnezzar takes Daniel and three of his friends and takes away their names that honor God and gives them new names that honor a demon. So now these guys are serving in the court of the king with a completely different identity in a completely new land. Okay, One of the things that Daniel does, and this is the first trait that we've got to get, Daniel has this amazing capacity to develop a heart of supernatural compassion for wicked people. 
it's weird, but he's not playing here. Daniel actually, he, he will come to a king to deliver a word, and he'll say things like this. And you're talking about evil kings. He'll say things like this, O king, live forever. Word to God, this word were for your enemies and not for you. He's not just paying lip service and homage to a king. He's literally developing compassion. One day he comes to Nebuchadnezzar because Nebuchadnezzar had crossed the line. He says to him, you're actually going, God's going to take your mind from you. You're going to go out and eat grass in a field for the next seven years. Nebuchadnezzar does. He lives like a, a beast out in the field for seven years. When he comes to himself and comes back into the palace, guess who's there waiting to serve him? Daniel. Hey, king, as if he never left, arms wide open, Nebuchadnezzar ends his life absolutely loving Daniel. Why? Because Daniel had a heart of genuine compassion for him. It's the first thing the church has got to get, to have a heart of genuine compassion even for wicked people. It's not something you, listen, D Darius, King Darius, call him Darius, Darius, pick a name, I don't care, it, however you want to pronounce it. He throws Daniel into a lion's den over a technicality in a law he made. The next morning, he runs to the den and goes, Daniel, is the God you serve able to save you? Daniel's like, oh, king, live forever. My God has shut the lion's mouth. This is not what I would have done. I would have been like, I don't know, why don't you come down here and find out? <laughs> you and I, we're not friends anymore. This was a deal breaker. Daniel literally cannot seem to get offended at anybody. His heart is so guarded against offense, it seems like everything he's doing is a divine assignment, and all he can do is see the hand of God moving everywhere. In Daniel chapter 2, don't have to turn there. We'll get to 9 in just a second. Daniel chapter 2, an amazing thing happens. King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, and he calls the wise men, the magicians, the astrologers together, and he says, I had a dream, super disturbing dream. I want you to tell me what it means. I'm not going to tell you the dream, though. Tell me the dream, too, and the interpretation. That is advanced prophetic ministry, right? The wise men, the magicians, the astrologers, they go, man, nobody can do that. And he goes, fine, I'm killing all of you. Not firing, killing all of you. Now, Daniel, he's a new guy. And so he kind of gets rolled up into this whole crowd. Next thing you know, Daniel goes, oh, whoa, 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 time out. I'm going to go talk to God. God gives him the interpretation and the dream. Daniel goes to his boss, and he says this. Tell the king I'll give him the interpretation on one condition, don't kill anybody. Why is that a big deal? Because these people, these wise men, magicians, and astrologers that grew up in Babylon were hungry for spiritual power. How would they have gotten it apart from God? They would have had to go to satanic, demonic sources to get it. So you're talking about people who have partnered with and been given over to the occult and to demons. You would think those people might be worth destroying get them out of the way so Daniel doesn't have any opposition. Daniel doesn't do that. Instead, he actually fights for their life and saves their life. Isn't that fascinating? Now listen, if you and I are one of those people and suddenly somebody comes in and saves our life and we want true spiritual power and this guy can do something we can't do, what, what's our new heart posture? Forget everything I know. I want to know what you know. Okay, now Daniel has disciples. Matter of fact, in Daniel chapter 10, which we'll read in just a little while, in Daniel 10, when he has his final encounter from heaven, there are a bunch of people with him who are just as terrified as he is. Who are they? You see that he picked them up in Daniel chapter 2 when he literally bought their lives and their allegiance. So the first thing the body of Christ has got to do is begin to learn how to connect with the heart of God who is a consuming fire of love and let that begin to flow through you to have compassion even for wicked people, right? Second thing, Daniel lives, and this is probably the hardest one for me personally, 
Daniel lives with a no compromise attitude toward the word of the Lord. And you say, now, Bill, why would that be hard? First, when I looked at this, I thought, of course, God, I live with a no compromise attitude toward the word of the Lord. That's just how I live, right? The word of the Lord comes to me, I'm just going to go after it. And I felt like the Lord said, yeah, you go out after a lot more than my word, too. A lot of times you have your own agenda and you call it mine. And I thought, well, yeah, but most of the time in my mind, my agenda is pretty virtuous. My agenda usually has to do with defending things that, that are uh, uh, of the kingdom of God. If something is coming against something that is of the kingdom of God, I feel an automatic knee-jerk reaction to give my attention to defending it. And it takes a lot of time and energy. And I felt like the Lord said, you're wearing yourself out, dying on hills I haven't called you to fight on. And I'm like, but I'm doing this for you. I'm marching for you. I'm protesting for you. Did I tell you to? No, but I just automatically assumed you'd be okay with it because it's for you. The Lord took me to Daniel and said, look at Daniel. Daniel seems to just go along with everything that's happening. The burning down of the temple, taking away of all of the, the, the implements, the gold out of the temple. Daniel doesn't seem to protest any of that. That would be worth protesting. The taking captive of the people into Babylon, Daniel doesn't seem to have an opinion about any of that. That would be worth having an opinion about. I think I would probably post about that online. Daniel, we see him push back. The first time he pushes back on something is when he's offered food from the king's table. And Daniel goes, no, God says, I'm supposed to eat vegetables today. I'm like, wait a minute now. Okay, so you have shown that you have the ability to push back on something. You don't push back on the burning down of the temple, the taking of the captives, the destruction of, the, of Jerusalem, the ripping away of your name, and all the other atrocities that are going on. But now, uh, you're going to fight over uh, the difference between a carrot stick and a filet mignon? It doesn't matter, Daniel. Why don't you push back on something that matters? And this is what I felt the Lord say. I was training Daniel how to hear my word, whether it made sense or not. And I realized over 30 years of pastoring and ministry, I get bombarded with people that come at me and say, you need to divert all your attention to this cause because this is the biggest deal of every deal that has ever been a deal. Daniel learned to discern between good ideas and God ideas. And listen, just because somebody else has a grace on their life to go pursuing, protesting, and dying on that hill, I think a lot of times we get this call and we're like, everybody's got to do what I'm passionate about. Maybe God only gave you the call. So then you go to your pastor because he's the professional, right? You go to your pastor and now you get your pa If you can't get your pastor on board, then, then, oh man, he must not be hearing God. As a pastor of a church for years, I can't tell you how many people came and said, we need to march for this. We need to fight for this. We need to do, and, I, and because I wanted to be a good Christian soldier, I'd say yes to everything. And next thing I know, I'm an activist. I'm dying on hills that God never called me to fight on, and I'm burning out, and I'm going, God, I'm doing your work. Why am I burning out? And I felt the Lord say, you will burn out when you become the fuel for your own move. When you link into what I'm doing and what I've called you to do, I'll be the fuel, and you won't burn out. And some of you in this last season, so many people have tied you into their cause and their call, and you wonder why it's burning you out. Not just on the cause, but on Christianity in general. People are walking away from faith. What do we got to do? Get linked back into a no compromise attitude to the word of the Lord. Do what God's called you to do. But there will be times where you go, I, I think I'm supposed to die on that hill, and God says, no. But if I don't fight on that hill, people are going to think I'm compromising. God says, no. Don't you imagine that Israel looked at Daniel and went, hey, 
You've got power in the palace. Why don't you use it to further our cause? I wonder if Daniel was looked at as a compromiser because the only people he prophesies over are wicked people. Interesting. But what Daniel is doing is he's literally living so linked into the word of the Lord that God, God can say, don't fight over the temple, don't fight over the, the, the exiles, don't fight over the destruction of Jerusalem. If they offer you a stake, refuse that. What is Daniel doing? He's learning to listen to God even in situations where it doesn't seem it's going to matter at all. He's demonstrating, God, you've got my ear and you've got my attention, and whether I understand it or not, I'm going along with whatever you say. What is God doing? He's setting Daniel up for something. And sometimes when God tells you, save your strength, don't fight on that hill, even though it seems righteous and everybody else is doing it, and God says, no, I want you to turn your attention over here to something that everybody else says doesn't matter at all, God is literally training you how to hear his voice so that you will hear and you will say yes when it does matter. All right? So first thing, Daniel lives with a radical compassion even towards wicked people. Second, Daniel lives with a no compromise attitude and heart toward the word of the Lord. Third, this we're going to pick up in Daniel chapter 9. In Daniel chapter 9, he finds the scroll of Jeremiah, the words of Jeremiah, and he's reading Jeremiah, and he discovers that Jeremiah prophesies that 70 years of captivity is coming to Jerusalem, and Daniel suddenly has a moment of revelation. We are in the middle of the very thing that Jeremiah prophesied about. Not just that, but we're actually in the middle of the will of God because God was orchestrating this whole thing. So what does Daniel do when he realizes he's in the middle of the will of God? Even though he walks with radical obedience to the word of the Lord, he develops in that obedience a relationship with God where he can have a dialogue with God about what's going on. So here's the deal. This is the lesson of this point. <clears throat> Daniel realizes he's in the middle of the will of God. He could have taken the path of saying, oh, well, we'll just kind of just ride this thing out, and whatever God's going to do, he's going to do, and we just have to endure it. Daniel doesn't do this. Daniel's confused. And he needs some clarity. And so Daniel decides to pray into the will of God. And in doing so, he petitions God to change his mind about a few things. This you can do when you're a friend of God. Moses and God have a conversation one day. God comes to Moses and says, Moses, stand back. I'm wiping all these people that you brought out of Egypt out. I'm just going to wipe them all out. We're just going to wipe them out. We'll start all over. Moses goes, time out. I didn't bring them out of Egypt, you did. They ain't my people. They're your people. And what are the surrounding nations going to say if you wipe them out? Their God doesn't have the power to deliver and save and keep them? And God goes, eh, you're right. If you got your good old-fashioned King James Bible, you can look at that story and you'll see this phrase, God repented. What was he doing? God was entering into a dialogue with a person made in his image and likeness because that's what God create. He's creating. He's creating family. I love talking with my kids. I don't tell them what to think. I teach them how to think, and then we dialogue about it, and I've actually given them the ability to change my mind about a few things. See, I know God, God knew exactly what he was doing. He was bringing something out of Moses of compassion for these people where Moses would literally stand in the gap for these people and God would go, good job. It's the way it works. Daniel does the exact same thing. In Daniel 9, he prays a prayer. And for the vast majority of the prayer that I'm not going to read today, he's confessing the sin of himself and of his people. I want you to go down to verse 17. This is where we're going to pick up Daniel's prayer. He says, so now our God, listen to the prayer of your servants and to his supplications. Everybody say the word supplication. It's an important word you're going to need to remember in just a moment. And for your sake, O Lord, let your face shine on your desolate sanctuary. O oh God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see from our desolations the city which is called by your name. For we are not presenting our supplications before you on account of any merits of our own, but on account of your great compassion. O oh Lord, hear. 
Oh Lord, forgive. Oh Lord, listen and take action. It's another way of saying, do something now. For your own sake, oh God, do not delay, because of your city and your people are called by your name. Now, while I was speaking and praying, he's doing five things here. I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people and presenting my supplication. Everybody say the word supplication. Okay, I want you to think of this word for just a moment. I'm going to tell you what happens in just a second. The word supplication is a word that simply means to ask for grace for people who don't deserve it. To ask for grace for people who don't deserve it. It's almost like you stand in the gap and go, God, we've sinned. My nation has sinned. I ask you for grace. What you're doing is asking for an outpouring of favor and mercy that we don't deserve. God only forgives people who don't deserve it. Daniel asks this. He's going through a number of things. He's talking to God. He's he's confessing his sin. He's confessing the sin of his people. And then he gets to this part where he says, and I present my supplications. In other words, I now got into the part where my, my eyes are off of me and off of us and our issues, and I appeal to you, God, to pour grace upon our land and upon our people. Suddenly, he says, while I was still speaking, the man Gabriel, the angel here, who I had seen in the vision previously, came to me in my extreme weariness about the time of the evening offering. He gave me instruction. He talked to me, and he said, Oh, Daniel, I've now come forth to give you insight and understanding. Now look at this line. At the beginning of your supplications, the command was issued. Now God doesn't, listen, God doesn't change the circumstances. What God does is he confronts the confusion Daniel had. If you're wondering what's going on in the world around you, ask God for grace. And God will often bring clarity, wisdom, insight and understanding as to not just his acts, but his ways. In other words, not what he's doing, but why he's doing it. This is a big deal. The angel literally comes to Daniel and says to him, here's the point at which heaven gave the command to give you insight when you started asking for grace. It's almost like God's sitting there going, wait, hold, hold, hold. And when Daniel gets to the point, goes, Lord, grace for us, for our people, for our land, for our nation. God goes, now, go. This is the third posture of Daniel's heart, and that is to ask for grace. It is totally legal for you to ask for grace for yourself, for your household, for your children, for your spouse, for your job, for your nation, for your city, for your region. Jeremiah chapter 5 and verse 1, there's a verse that goes like this. God tells Jeremiah, in the middle of a time of judgment, God tells Jeremiah, run through the streets of the city of Jerusalem. If you can find one person who loves justice and seeks the truth, I will pardon the city. Now think about that. Under an old covenant system, God tells Jeremiah, we know that truth from a new covenant perspective, is Christ. It's the presence of the Spirit of God. God's telling Jeremiah, run through the streets of this city, and if you can find one person who's hungry for my spirit, I'll pour grace out on this whole city. Why is it a big deal that you keep the fire burning on the altar of your heart? Why is it a big deal that you keep the fire burning on the altar of your heart for your city and for your region? Because even under an old covenant system, one hungry person could let mercy be poured out from heaven over an entire city. Okay? There's enough enough mercy in this room to cover this whole state. There's enough fire in this room to cover this whole state. First, let God develop in you a heart of compassion, even for wicked people. Second, live with a no-compromise attitude towards the word of the Lord, even when it doesn't make sense. Don't die on hills that God hasn't called you to fight on. Third, 
ask God for grace. When the Philippian jailer came to Paul and said, what must I do to be saved? Paul responded like this, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Is it possible that you and I could literally beseech God for such a grace and overwhelming favor of his presence that could impact you, your spouse, your kids, your grandkids for generations? Yeah, I think so. I think the grace of God goes farther, wider, deeper, higher than you and I can even begin to imagine if we'll simply ask. Supplication. Last two. Go to Daniel chapter 10. This is where we're going to land today. Daniel chapter 10 is Daniel's most radical encounter with the Lord. And and i got to tell you, Daniel comforts my heart in so many ways because I've had angelic experiences and angelic encounters. I'm always freaked out every time. I'm, I'm like, I'm a rookie. Doesn't matter how many times I have these things, it freaks me out 100% of the time. I, I go to conferences where, you know, some, somebody will get up and say, yeah, I was in my hotel room the other day, and an angel showed up and sat on the edge of the bed, and we chatted for a little while, and then he left, and here was, and I'm like, what? Every angelic encounter I've had has made me glad I went to the bathroom a short while before, because, I, I mean, this is, my, here's my experience with it. I'll, I'll give you one. Tracy and I had. We had we're traveling with a spiritual son of ours, a guy named Alex Morales. He's a pastor now. We're in Boston, Massachusetts, and uh, I, had a, I had just a free afternoon. I wanted to go see Cheers because I'm a child of the 80s. So the only place we could find a park was on the other side of Boston Commons, exactly corner to corner from Cheers. We didn't know which side it was on. So we parked in this parking garage. We get out, and it's a cold day, and I look over, and there's a homeless guy sitting up against uh, a, a building, and he's, um, he stood out to me because he had a big old swollen black eye, had a busted lip with blood on his mouth, and he was holding a styrofoam cup with a chunk taken out of it. He was sitting there on the ground, and I looked over at him, and I had this just overwhelming feeling that this guy is not from around here. He has, he has come from afar. And, uh, and I thought to myself, I should probably engage with him. I, immediately, for whatever reason, I thought, I bet that's an angel, because sometimes angels show up weird. And they're always a little quirky, always a little weird, as if the human orientation class in heaven is lacking somewhere, right? So, so, so I thought to myself, okay, all right, okay, we're, we're going to run over and see Cheers. We only got a little while. We're going to run over and see it. We're going to come back. When I come back, I'll engage with this guy, right? But I'm not 100% sure yet. I get across Boston Commons and sitting on the ground against a building next to Cheers is the exact same guy. Same black eyes, same busted lips, same cup, sitting there staring right at me. And immediately I think, that's an angel. Now, I don't know about you, but in the back of our mind, I think we always think, you know, when I get before God, I'm going to have questions, right? Well, the same thing happens if you know that you're having an angelic encounter. You might think to yourself, I got some questions. I'm gonna engage, we're going to get some revelation out of this moment because this angel knows stuff. This angel has seen stuff, Right? Paul said it like this, be careful how you treat strangers because many of you have entertained angels without even knowing it, right? Every one of you have had angelic encounters. Most probably haven't even had a clue that you were having it, right? Just look for unusual, weird circumstances. They're just all around that. So so I I think to myself, I don't say anything to Tracy or Alex. I just think to myself, I'm going to go back. This is my fleece. Just to make 100% sure that this is a, a messenger. I'm going to go back across the commons, and I'm going to watch. There's no way that he could have gotten from there to here unless he was running, right? So I'm going to watch, and I'm just keep looking back. And there he is. He's still back there. Now we get halfway across the commons, and we come up to the bank building. Sure enough, this guy is sitting right there up against this building. Same exact guy. Now, I'm thinking to myself, I got some questions. The closer I got, the less questions I had, Right? The closer I get, the more I'm kind of in this trembling mode. I got a little bit of cash in my pocket. I don't know how much I've got, but I I just take the whole wad of cash, and I walk over to him. Now I'm I'm lost for questions. I I have no questions. My mind has gone completely blank, and this is all I say. I kneel down in front of him. Alex is walking up behind me, and I say, we're going to go talk to this guy. I kneel down in front of him. I take the cash out, and I put put it in his cup, and I just simply looked him straight in the eye, and I said, I know who you are. 
Sure as I'm sitting here, and Tracy's right over there. She's standing here. Alex is standing here. Three of us saw the exact same thing. His eye, his swollen eye, completely heals up, and all the black and blue goes away. All the swelling goes away. You just see it. Just shh. His lip, his split lip comes together, and the blood disappears, and he smiles at me because angels are weird. <laughs> Here's what I do. I stand up. I turn like I'm in the like I'm in the military. I turn and I start walking. Alex is standing behind me, going, "Whoa, whoa! Did you see where where are we going? Like, what is happening right now?" And I, I'm just going, "We gotta go. We gotta go. We got we gotta go." I don't know why. It's like it just hit me, and I'm going, "I gotta get out of it. I, I, I'm not worthy of this." So. If you want to know how to interact with angels, don't come and ask me. I'm not good at it, right? But I feel better when I watch Daniel because Daniel has an angelic encounter with a messenger who looks an awful lot like Jesus in Revelation. Yeah. Jesus actually does show up in the book of Daniel. He shows up in the fiery furnace, and the guy who recognizes it is crazy Nebuchadnezzar, right? Nonetheless, Daniel has this amazing encounter with this heavenly messenger and finds himself trembling and on the ground. And the messenger stands him up, and Daniel stands up trembling, right? And the messenger reveals two things to Daniel that will tie up this five-point message. And these two things are two huge keys to answered prayer that the body of Christ has got to adopt. Daniel chapter 10 and verse, let me just read verse 10. We'll go down to verse 12. Behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. He said to me, O Daniel, man of high esteem. Imagine a messenger from God coming, calling you by name and telling you that about yourself. This is how heaven sees you, all right? Man of high esteem, understand the words I'm about to tell you and stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. When he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. Then he said, do not be afraid, Daniel. Ready? For from the first day that you set your heart on understanding and on humbling yourself before your God, your words were heard. These last two keys are huge keys we've got to get. The first one, Daniel, here's the deal. Heaven recognizes that you're teachable. You set your heart toward understanding. Listen, I say this everywhere I go. People say, you know, how do you get wisdom in revelation? I say, here's the way it works for me. I come to God with questions. He'll answer some of my questions, but he always gives me more than I started with. So I always end up knowing less than I did before. So I wish you'd have known me 20 years ago when I knew everything. Because now I just love the phrase, I don't know. Because God is not in the business of answering your questions as much as he is in questioning your answers. To consistently bring us back to that place of going, God, I never want to be an expert in any of this, in any of this. Years ago, I had had a crazy supernatural experience that led us out of the first church that Tracy and I had ever pastored. And uh, uh, I had a friend of mine, it's October of 2006, I had a friend of mine said, you know, Bill, uh, why don't you come to this conference? There's this guy named Bill Johnson who'll be speaking to this guy. I'd never heard of Bill before, never read any of his books, never heard him speak. Uh, And and I I said, yeah, I'm conferenced out, man. I just don't feel like I want to go. And he goes, no, I really feel like you need to go to this. That was on a Thursday. And that Thursday night, I woke myself up in the middle of the night, and I, I, was wait, I woke myself up saying this phrase, what you know will keep you from what you need to know if you don't remain a novice. I was repeating the phrase over and over again. I was saying it out loud. I never used the word novice. It really kind of struck me. And I don't talk in my sleep, as far as I know. And, and so I, when I got up and I heard myself saying this, I took a pen and paper, and I wrote down what I said on the nightstand, went back to sleep, and didn't think anything about it. The next morning, I knew in my spirit I was supposed to go to this conference. But because I wasn't super zealous about it, I showed up late. The place was packed. A room about this size was totally packed. No seats left. So I came in the door, and I stood up against the wall. 
Bill's standing up there at the front, super unassuming, and he says three phrases. He says, Jesus Christ is the most normal Christian in the Bible. Hmm, long pause. Then he says, Jesus Christ is perfect theology. Hmm, long pause. Then he scans the room, looks right at me, and says this. What you know will keep you from what you need to know if you don't remain a novice. I was a young pastor, a Bible college graduate. I had built a church, bought land, built a church with my own hands. I had bled in the floor of that church. I mean, I, it, the building process, it was mine. And I'd, I'd finally got it basically taken out of my hands and says, time to walk away. I have a new journey for you. I walked away, and in my mind, I'm an expert. I know exactly how to do all of this. In that moment, I knew nothing. You guys, remember the time where Jesus said, unless you're converted and become like a child, you can't even see the kingdom. What was he saying? He says, as long as you think you're an expert on this spiritual stuff, you're going to be living in the seen realm, operating from the seen realm. But there's a greater unseen realm, and in order for you to access the unseen realm, you're going to have to put yourself in the, the, the beautiful, wide-eyed, wondered state of being a child. Unless you converted, changed. In the kingdom of God, maturity is childlikeness. In the kingdom of God, maturity takes you into a state of wonder. All of us were friends of Jack Taylor. Those of us who have been speaking to the conference this week, the older Jack got, the more wonder he had in his eyes. The older Jack got, the more childlike he got. I go down to Satellite Beach, and we'd sit in Jack's condo and looking out over the ocean, and I'm looking for great spiritual wisdom. He'd give me one nugget, and then he'd turn to me and say, you know what I'd want to do right now more than anything else? And I'd think, pray, intercede, anoint me with oil and give me an impartation. And he'd look at me and go, go get ice cream. <laughs> I'm waiting for a word. We're walking across the street to get ice cream. I sit there watching this amazing general of the faith, and with every lick of his ice cream cone, he is just having a moment of delight. And I felt like the Lord said, you're not even enjoying your ice cream, are you? <laughs> and I realized that's it. I, I've got to just stop and enjoy every moment and learn to hear your voice in everything. I go to a conference, and I watch, and I, I, see, I see the latest celebrity Christian on the stage holding a microphone, and I'm sitting there leaning in. This happened at a conference some time ago. I'm, I'm leaning in. I'm waiting because I want a word from God, and I think I'm going to need somebody who's extra special to give it to me. And there's this kid sitting next to me, a, a, a child of one of the, the speakers that are there or one of the worship leaders that are there. I don't know who this kid is. Keeps tugging on my shirt, and I'm thinking, thinking to myself, stop, I'm trying to hear from God. I'm not going to say that, but that's what I'm thinking. Finally, to get the kid to leave me alone, I lean over and go, yeah, what? And this kid gives me a word that absolutely rocked me in my core, and I end up with God telling me, yeah, you thought you were going to get a word from that, and I can hide my word in anything. If you'll open your ear, I'll speak through anyone. Like, Yes, Lord, I'm just a child. I know nothing. The older I get in this faith, the less I realize I need to know. All I need to know is one thing, Jesus. Jesus. He, he becomes his name, his essence, his person becomes the answer for everything. Stay teachable. Last one. He says, and when you determine to walk humbly before God. This may be the most mystical point in this entire message. When we think of humility, most of the time we think of ourselves cowering in the presence of an almighty God. We think of ourselves as going super low, like a king to a peasant relationship. But when Jesus comes to put on display the relationship we're supposed to have with God, it's not so much king to peasant as it is father to son. In other words, there's tremendous honor, but there's also a depth of intimacy and connection by blood. And here's the beauty of this, this, this thing. In the new covenant, familiarity doesn't breed contempt. Familiarity doesn't mean that I come in a cocky attitude before the throne of grace. I come with bold confidence, but I still come trembling into the presence of the Lord. There's something about this where in the new covenant, intimacy and union don't work against each other. 
the more I realize my reconciled union with the Father because of what Christ has done, I don't just be like, yeah, Jesus lives in with me, no big deal. He lives in me, no big deal. Now, all of a sudden, I'm a little more careful. The postures of my heart, the things my eyes see, the things my ears hear, the fruit of intimacy and humility together will actually give you the discipline to start guarding your heart and your life a little bit, a little bit closer. You know what I'm saying? Why? I, I talked to a young lady the other day, a dear friend of ours, and, uh, and I said to her, she's got a, got a new boyfriend, and, and uh, oh my goodness, they're just two beautiful people. And you know what happens when two beautiful young people these days, especially when intimacy is so flippant. And, and so I say to herself, I say, I say to her, I say, how, um, how are you handling this? How are you handling this relationship thing? She says, you know, it's really interesting because I realize if I compromise in this area, I know I'm going to have a hard time hearing the voice of the Lord. And the value I have for hearing the voice of the Lord goes above everything else. She says, I've heard his voice. I've spent so much time with him. He is my life. His voice is my life. I'm not doing anything to compromise hearing that voice. I'm thinking that's, listen, we got a generation right now that maybe understands, in, they understand like having a love for God. They've grown up with the idea that God is good all the time, and that's absolutely true. But one of the things that I actually miss seeing, and I'm looking for it in the body of Christ, and this is a mark of revival, is radical humility and awe in the presence of the Lord. Where we actually, we don't run from the Lord, we actually tremble running to his presence. We want to get closer, but we don't get closer with this cocky attitude, like it doesn't matter, he's my dad, he's never going to reject me. No, he'll never leave you or forsake you. But listen, when you discover the consuming fire of his love, oh my goodness, there's something about that that sets me in a state of trembling in the presence of God. When I allow myself to become aware of the presence of God, there is a supernatural divine humility that rests upon me where I'm just like, Whew. sometimes I just don't need to say a word and just let him speak to me. You find humility in the presence of the Lord when you begin to discover the power of listening prayer because he wants to talk to you more than you want him to. Sometimes letting him cut through the noise of everyday life takes a little bit. It's what discipleship is all about, by the way. The word disciple and discipline are actually kind of really closely linked together. And Jesus never told us to go and make converts or believers. He told us to make disciples. And you can become a believer in a moment by faith, but you will not become a disciple in a moment by faith. Discipleship is when you say yes to Jesus and tomorrow you do it again and the next day you do it again, and the next day you do it again. And I love the fact that many of you are burning for God right now and have a passion for God right now. Let me come back and visit with you in 20 years and see if that fire is still lit. And you know, sometimes the things that will make the root system go deep is when you face the wind of adversity, and rather than looking for God to rescue, you actually find him right in the middle of it. As Ted Decker said years ago when he came to this conference, he said, God will actually let you walk into the valley of the shadow of death, but you don't walk alone. He walks with you to reveal to you that death is nothing but a shadow. And he doesn't leave you in the valley. He literally shows you the way out. And that's the deal. Many of you in this last season have found a time of suffering hit your life in ways that you never thought possible. Did he leave you? No. Here's one of the greatest mysteries of faith, and that is in the midst of suffering, pain, loss, tragedy, and betrayal when you find his presence right there. See, the thing is that you and I don't suffer alone. And there are times where he will invade our suffering with his light and his life and his healing. But here's the deal. When you have his presence, you really don't need much of anything else. When you have him, you really don't need much of anything else. So many times in meetings, maybe some of you are going to experience this today. So many times in meetings, I've been talking about the goodness of God, drawing our attention back to the face and the loving eyes of Christ. Have people come up to me at the end of the meeting and say, I walked in with chronic pain or I walked in with this condition. It's crazy, but it's gone now. And I go, when did it leave? And they go, I don't know. 
What happened? You got your eyes off of the suffering and off of the circumstances, and once it got onto Jesus, all of a sudden the circumstances lost their power over your emotions, over your feelings, over your life. I've seen skin conditions leave. I've seen tumors dissolve. What? Because they got prayed for? Sure, those things happen. But these days, you know what I'm seeing more than ever? is issues that people walked in in their physical body, in their marriage, stress, mental problems. Those things get healed by literally getting their attention turned on to Jesus. Right in the middle of your circumstances. And sometimes negative circumstances are like spoiled two-year-olds. When you stop giving them attention, they just kind of run away. Kind of weird how that works, but it's true. Daniel lived with five distinct qualities. I'm going to finish up with this. This is, I'm almost preached all 10 hours of this message. I feel like it. <clears throat> Daniel lived with these five distinct qualities. He walked in radical compassion toward wicked people. He literally lived with no compromise toward the word of the Lord. He asked for grace for himself, his household, his nation. He, he literally put himself in a posture always of being a student. And finally, he walked in humility before God. You say, What's the big deal that I follow this example? I'll tell you. Daniel dies in Babylon. Or he dies actually in what is now the city, what is now known as the city of Susa. It's in Iran. And Babylon uh, uh, was taken over by the Persians. And when the captivity was over, only about 50,000 50, Jews left and went back to rebuild the temple. The rest of the Jews had actually made a home in Babylon, but they didn't let go of their identity. They held on to that. And so you had a ton of Persian Jews that literally were still in that part of the world until 1979. Many of them fled to the United States. The interesting thing about Daniel is that at the end of Daniel's life, you see something fascinating take place, but you have to wait 400 years to see it. So there's three things that Daniel knew. One of the things that Daniel knew that was really important was he knew that the biggest deal of all big deals was the coming of the Messiah. Daniel had read the scroll of Isaiah that said how the Messiah would come. Behold, a virgin will conceive and bear a son. He read the scroll of Micah that said out of Bethlehem will come your king. He knew, knew where he would come, just didn't know when until Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9, he gets a vision that basically says this is going to be the end of the old covenant system around 490 years from now. But prior to that, the Messiah will show up. He will, he will be cut off. And, and so you have a generation prior to that. That would be roughly about 400, 430 years after Daniel's life. So now Daniel has a timeline. He knows how, he knows where, and he knows when. What are some of the things that he might pass on to his disciples? Super important things like the coming of of the Messiah, the ending of the Old Covenant. How long is this passed on? Well, let's go to the birth of Jesus. In the birth of Jesus, you see the prophetic com company around Jesus during that day totally missed it. They didn't know that he was even born. Some shepherds got a choir concert out in the middle of the, of the desert on third shift, but other than that, nobody else had a clue that the Son of God had been born in a barn. But there were a group of people that did know. The Bible says wise men, here's the word, magi. It's from where we get the term magician. It's a Babylonian term. Magi from the east in the direction of what had formerly been Babylon, 400 years later, crossed the desert. What were they following? The stars. What do they do? They come to Bethlehem. They're care We'd say three wise men. It wasn't three. How do we know that? Three. We have gold, frankincense, and myrrh. You need one wise man to carry each gift. So we get three. We counted three. There's no place in the Bible that says three. These wise men, which I believe, and actually if you, go to, if you go to Susa, you can see the shrine to Daniel. They actually built a shrine with Daniel's story in it that talks about the multi-generational uh, impartation that he gave to people. Their descendants, they will say, our descendants were the wise men. Why? Because Daniel told us how, when, and where. And to keep our eyes on the stars, we follow God, and we follow the supernatural acts. And what happens? They come to a barn carrying what Bible scholars will say is the equivalent of around $12 million worth of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They are so taken with the idea that what they're seeing is actually the Messiah laying in a feeding trough 
they not only bow down and worship, but they give one of the biggest offerings in history. Where did they get the money? From the guy who was second in command in Babylon and served multiple kings, Daniel, laid up an offering passed down through 400 years of discipleship to give to the Messiah to fund the flight to Egypt where he could grow up in safety. Here's the deal with Daniel, and this is why I felt like the, give me chills thinking about it. This is why I felt like the Lord said, in our moment of uncertainty, in our season of Babylon, God is raising up a Daniel company who can see multi-generationally their contribution toward what God is doing in the next generation. Daniel could overlook the burning down and destruction of the temple of stone because he got a vision of the incarnation of the temple of God in fleshed, coming to earth, living among us, and that's where his wealth was going. You can let the political spirit of the day get your eyes off of the move of God. And I've watched ministers and pastors become cheerleaders for the political spirit without even realizing it because they're drawing more attention to the activities of the devil in the world than they are the activities of the Lord. But God is raising up a Daniel company who's locked into his voice, who's exercising radical compassion without compromise, who literally live humbly in the presence of God. They stay teachable in their heart, and they're not afraid to ask for grace. Stand with me this morning. Father, I pray right now by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would seal this word in our heart. God, would you raise up in us the heart of Daniel to be able to see years into the future, to see the activities of heaven years into the future for this region. We see this region lit with the gospel. We see this region hungry for God. Every man, woman, and child hungry for the presence of the Lord. We see an outpouring of the oil and the fire of your spirit all over Elmira, Horseheads, and Corning. God, we see this region absolutely in engulfed in revival. Thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing. And Father, we pray that you would do it in our day. Let us see it with our eyes. Let us be a part of your move. God, move us. Thank you, Jesus, for your grace. And I say grace, grace, grace over Journey Center and over this town, over this region, over this city. Grace, grace, grace to it in the name of Jesus. Amen.